and welcome back to Webcams TV Live here at Comash 2011. Now in the last five minutes we have managed to acquire a rather large TV, which is fantastic. Um, and that is going to be showing how to tweet your questions to the interviewees throughout the rest of the session. Now we've got a jam-packed schedule. Um, we're really excited to be joined by all of these industry experts and back again is Sean Walker from .NET Nuke. And Sean of course is the CTO and co-founder. Um, welcome back, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so building on some of the things that we talked about in the panel session, yeah. um, the .NET Nuke has got some interesting you know, roadmaps ahead. Can you share anything about those and what the plans are in detail? Okay. So, um, so in terms of the roadmap that we talked about, um, we've got uh, CMS redefined as cloud mobile social for the next year at least. Um, so in the cloud area, um, I think I already covered some of these things, but uh, the fact that we want to run uh, well on Azure. So we've been doing a lot of research there in terms of getting .NET Nuke running on Azure. Uh, we already run well on Amazon EC2 as another cloud provider. Um, we're also capable of running on Rackspace Cloud. But beyond that, um, we feel it's very advantageous for us to have an on-demand version of our platform. So when somebody comes to the .netnuke.com site, um, they have to figure out how to install the application. Um, some developers would obviously like to install it locally, but um, others may want to actually get a website up and running immediately. So in those cases, it would be great if we had an on-demand solution that they could actually get a .NET Nuke site up and running immediately. So in, in that ca context, perhaps it's not the elastic nature of the cloud, but it is an on-demand version of our software. And so that's something that we want to deliver in 2011. Uh, on the mobile side, I already explained that we want to uh, provide a, a good experience for many different types of devices that are browsing to .NET Nuke websites. Um, so not just necessarily mobile, but some 10-foot devices like TV, M many different devices, not just mobile. And on the social side, um, the emergence of Facebook and uh, the Facebook fan pages is an interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. There's many businesses now that are actually setting up their web presence on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, but the Facebook tooling is very limited in terms of what you're capable of doing. So we still feel that a web content management system is going to be the central tool where you manage your web content. And then it would be great if you could then publish that web content out to something like Facebook seamlessly so that you could basically multiple, maintain multiple presences from a central source. I see. So you, do you see Facebook as, in some ways, as a competitor to you but in the early stages? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's hard to know where Facebook is going to go. They obviously have a lot of, like a huge community, right? Millions and millions of users utilizing that service. Um, they, have the, they have the opportunity to do a lot with that platform. So we do have to pay attention to what they're doing. But at the same sense, Facebook seems to have a mindset around making their platform open and adaptable to others. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I think that there's opportunity for content management systems like ourselves to integrate with Facebook um, so that we can tap into that, that, th those eyeballs. Right, and of course, you're talking about the social graph. Correct. And being able to get say, Facebook data out and in yep. um, of a person's profile. Now, what, how easy is that to do? Um, those particular things in .NET Nuke today. Have you made any developments there to make it super easy? Uh, so not in the core platform itself, there isn't any Facebook integration specifically yet. Uh, there is obviously a number of third-party modules that do Facebook integration today. Uh, in fact, I wrote a couple myself that, uh, that do that um, a few years ago when the Facebook platform opened. It, Facebook is an interesting platform, um, and I expect that there'll be a lot more people building modules that utilize the sort of the social graph and some of the other capabilities as we go forward. Right. And you said you haven't got anything in core right now for Facebook. No. Do you see that in, in the future for .NET Nuke? Uh, definitely a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, have, we have integration with a number of other services such as Google Analytics and things like that. Yep. So it wouldn't be a far stretch for us to include some Facebook integration at some point. Now when you do integration with the likes of Facebook and Google Analytics at a core level, do you try and do all that work based on standards so that you can you know, swap in other providers like Twitter, for example. So right. I'm, I'm thinking activity streams for, for yeah. the social space. No, it's, it's a good point. So, I mean, it's a point that I touched on a bit earlier in the fact that .NET Nuke is a platform. Um, and it's been one of the strengths of the product over time is that people can build extensions. So anytime we try to build new functionality to the platform, we usually do it in a manner that it's extensible so that we can take advantage of an extensibility point, but so can other people. So perhaps, I mean, we're interested in Google Analytics, but somebody else might be interested in a different type of analytics service. So we shouldn't stop them from being able to implement those other services if they so desire. 
And in fact, I mean, we have our snow-covered marketplace, which has about 8,000 commercial extensions available now, and that number continues to grow. So as we add more extensibility points to our platform, the number of extensions increases, and the number of choices that customers have when they utilize our platform increases as well, mm -hmm. which is good for everyone. Yeah. Tell me more about making money on .NET. You mentioned the marketplace there. Right. Are people making you know, real livings out of just Absolutely. creating .NET new websites and selling them through the market? Yeah, so that's something that's quite interesting is the commercial ecosystem that's around .NET Nuke. Uh, it's been there since almost day one. Uh, so both in terms of ISVs creating third-party products, which they sell through our marketplace for you know prices that range from anywhere like $10, $20 all the way up to a few hundred dollars. Um, the volume of modules that are sold through there make it sustainable for at least a, a, a certain number of vendors to rely on that revenue as their sole source of income. So they actually have businesses that have built themselves up, ISVs, that are relying solely on snow-covered revenue to sustain themselves. And then we also have a huge number of system integrators as well that are doing business with the .NET new platform mm -hmm. and doing projects and implementations for specific customers. Right. So there's a lot of commerce that happens around this open source application. Mm -hmm. If I'm um, somebody who's interested in .NET Nuke and wants to get involved in the community, but actual like contributing and writing code and modules, et cetera, for .NET right. Nuke, um, do you have help for people like that that want to? I mean, don't mean help psychologically, yeah. but, but I mean, like, do you have a do you have a do you have assistance like that you can get them started? Yeah, now there's a lot of uh, developers that just have an interest in writing code, and they might not necessarily be working on things in their work environment that are they find very interesting. So they, that's why they might gravitate towards open source projects where they can get involved and perhaps you know get noticed. Um, typically, the way people initially get involved in our ecosystem is through our forums so they get involved and they learn sort of who the key players are within the uh, the different teams and they help other people out in the forums so they start to build a reputation and get recognized uh, we actually recently introduced a community recognition system oh, nice. so that depending on the types of activities that you're doing in the ecosystem whether you're answering forum questions or posting comments on blogs or or whether you're, you've actually created open source projects and put them in our forge you get points for that and so those people rise to the top of the community and they get you know, kudos and reputation for it. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, th I mean, they, they start building, uh, we, they start, we start building some trust with them. And once that starts to happen, then we sort of open up our arms and allow them to get more deeply involved in the .NET Nuke uh, open source development. Cool. Now, Microsoft has been engaging a lot more with open source recently. Uh, has that surprised you? Or, you know, did you <laughs> expect it? I mean, if I think about our recent contributions to jQuery, NuGet, for example, um, the work with our, our open source web application partners, yeah. is that a good thing, generally? I think it's a good thing. I think it's encouraging. I mean, obviously, you probably know that .NET Nuke is sort of the oldest native open source. Most mature. Most mature <laughs> open source project native to Windows platform. Yeah. So when we first launched .NET Nuke back in uh, late 2002, uh, under an open source license, um, a lot of people would scratch their heads and they would say, open source on the Microsoft platform? Isn't that an oxymoron? It doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, but when in fact, I mean, when you looked at it from a, a more practical perspective, there's obviously developers that want to take advantage of productivity type of tools like .NET Nuke, so if, and they would like to do it under an open source license, so of course it makes sense. But uh, the mindset was clearly not there at those stages, and, and Microsoft was kind of, I think, watching us very carefully, but not necessarily offering much support. Um, in 2004, though, they did sponsor, Microsoft did reach out and sponsor me for a period of one year to help grow the .NET Nuke ecosystem because I think that they, they noticed at that point that um, it was a good thing to have a large open source community. That, that all existed in the Java world, that existed in the PHP world, and it was missing in the, in the Microsoft world. So over time, I, Microsoft has definitely demonstrated that they're more friendly towards open source, and that's a good thing. Right, excellent. Now. Um, we talked a bit about the future of, of .NET New. What? Tell me, like, some interesting facts about .NET New that people might not know about its history. That about it. Well, I mean, I think the most interesting one is that the .NET New project itself started as a sample application from Microsoft. Oh, right. So there was a sample application called the I by Spy Portal, which was released in 2000, 2001. Um, I believe actually Scott Guthrie himself worked on some of the code for that initial application. Um, it was one of the few reference applications that were available for .NET 1.0. And it, it was very limited, but it offered sort of an insight into where .NET Nuke could go. And so, I, I mean, I, I 
downloaded that application like many other developers and started extending it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that sort of formed the, the initial genesis of .NET Nuke, which is in pretty interesting. Fantastic. Well, Sean, thanks so much for spending the time. It's been great to have you yeah. on Webcamps TV Live. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Now, guys, stay tuned. We've got lots of more interesting interviews uh, for you. We've got um, uh, Ryan Ozemek from Joomla. We've got um, Niels Hartwig back from Umbraco. Um, we've got um, Rises Shah from PayPal talking about e-commerce and Drupal 7 as well with Jim Taylor. But now we're going to show you more footage from the WebMatrix team themselves. And we're going to show a, a clip from Jim Wang who is going to teach you all about helpers. Roll the tape. Hi everybody and welcome back to Webcamps TV. Today we're talking about Web Matrix and we're joined by Jim Wang from the ASP.NET team. Jim, welcome. Thank you, James. It's always a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. What do you do at Microsoft? So I work on the ASP.NET QA team. Uh, we, we ensure that all of our products are tested, ready for release, and that you guys all have a great experience. And one of the products we've been working on, as you know, is Web Matrix. Fantastic. Now before we get to Web Matrix, I noticed that on your board in your office you have a collection of errata fine automobiles. Now, which Indeed. car are you driving at the moment, Jim? Is it the Lambo or is it the Ferrari, maybe the Dodge? Uh, yeah, it is the not pictured 2010 Honda Fit. Excellent. So not quite as luxurious as perhaps the Mercedes SLK there, but... Probably not. I've been hearing some great things about these things called helpers. Now, just explain to everybody at home what a Web Matrix helper is. Right, so Web Matrix Helper is basically a bundle of code that we've gone ahead and we at Microsoft, along with the community, have gone ahead and put together. And this really enables simple web tasks to become much, much easier. For example, if I want to add a Twitter profile widget to my page, before I'd have to go off to Twitter.com, figure out what the code is I need to put in my page, figure out what all the settings are. And now with ASP.NET Web Helpers, we've changed the, the ecosystem essentially, where you just go ahead, download Microsoft.Web Helpers, which, is, which comes in assembly make a simple one-line call that says twitter.profile and you're done. Let's see in a demo. All right, let's get the Twitter helper. I'm going to start with the starter site. And once this comes up, I'm going to go ahead and run it. Many of you may have seen this before. For the purposes of the demo, we're going to assume you've got Web Matrix up and running. You'll notice that I can register, I can log in, there's a home and an about page. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put the Twitter helper on the about page. So. First thing I'm going to have to do is go to the ASP.NET package administration UI. And so this is the, the mechanism by which you're going to be able to download helper packages, including, in this case, the Microsoft Web Helpers library, oh, and also other third-party libraries that other developers have contributed. In this case, we're looking for Twitter, so we're going to go ahead and grab that functionality from ASP.NET Web Pages admin. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and create a password. Uh, and I get this security prompt. Basically, it says, hey, we've got this file named password.config in the app data admin folder. It's got an underscore on it. Please rename it without the underscore so that we can start serving you the, the admin UI. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, before you guys panic, the password.config file does not actually include your password. It includes a hash. The reason we have this extra security check in place is just to ensure that no one really beats you to setting up a password on your site. So that's done. Enter my password, and the UI pops up. So I'm going to go and look for packages that are online. You'll notice we default to the installed view, so I don't actually have any of these installed. Mm -hmm. For the purposes of this demo, we're primarily interested in the ASP.NET Web Helpers library. So I've gone ahead and clicked on that. Click Install. That goes ahead, does everything for me, finds out where, where the helper assembly lives, pulls it down to my page. It says, hey, ASP.NET Web Helpers Library 1.0 was successfully installed. So now when I go back to Web Matrix, hit refresh, you'll notice that my bin directory now has Microsoft.Web.Helpers.dll. So the package is installed by default, and everything's taken care of you, for yep. you. Yep, and if I change my mind, I can actually go back to the admin UI, and you'll notice that I've now got this uninstall button. We're not going to click this. You're going to have to trust me that this works <laughs> seamlessly. But uh, we're just going to go ahead and get our Twitter functionality up and running. So. My about page, I'm just going to go twitter.profile. This is my, my Twitter tag. Render, and there you go. Beautiful screen with my tweets and my direct replies up all, all, all in one, one shot. So we, we can't actually show you any of these, but we do have additional Twitter helpers for a tweet me button. We do have the URL shortener, 
a Razer debugger, which is really cool. I encourage you guys to check this out um, because Web Matrix doesn't have a built-in debugger, but this Web debugger I think is actually way better. You've got a PayPal helper, an OData helper, all in a quick edit helper. These are things that James and his team have put together. Really useful, really uh, brilliant helpers. And also the BB code helper was actually contributed by a third-party developer in Greece, yep. uh, which is really really cool. We, we're really starting to try to build an ecosystem of these helpers. And hopefully by the time uh, this video comes out, we'll have even more in the feed. And um, really, like, like we've demonstrated, it's really easy to download a package into your website, start using the helper, and get really cool functionality really quickly. Fantastic. Jim, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, James.